Chapter Eight of Joe's Boys. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa. Joe's Boys by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Eight. Josie plays mermaid. While the young Bayers were having serious experiences at home, Josie was enjoying herself immensely at Rocky Nook for the Lawrences knew how to make summer idleness both charming and wholesome. Bess was very fond of her little cousin. Mrs. Amy felt that whether her niece was an actress or not, she must be a gentlewoman, and gave her the social training which marks the well-bred woman everywhere, while Uncle Laurie was never happier than when rowing, riding, playing, or lounging, with two gay girls beside him. Josie bloomed like a wild flower in this free life. Bess grew rosy, brisk, and merry, and both were great favorites with the neighbors, whose villas were by the shore or perched on the cliffs along the pretty bay. One crumpled rose-leaf disturbed Josie's peace. One baffled wish filled her with a longing which became a mania, and kept her as restless and watchful as a detective with a case to work up. Miss Cameron, the great actress, had hired one of the villas and retired thither to rest and create a new part for next season. She saw no one but a friend or two, had a private beach, and was invisible except during her daily drive, or when the opera-glasses of curious gazers were fixed on a blue figure disporting itself in the sea. The Lawrences knew her, but respected her privacy, and after a call left her in peace till she expressed a wish for society, a courtesy which she remembered and repaid later, as we shall see. But Josie was like a thirsty fly buzzing about a sealed honey-pot, for this nearness to her idol was both delightful and maddening. She pined to see, hear, talk with, and study this great and happy woman, who could thrill thousands by her art, and win friends by her virtue, benevolence, and beauty. This was the sort of actress the girl meant to be, and few could object if the gift was really hers, for the stage needs just such women to purify and elevate the profession which should teach as well as amuse. If kindly Miss Cameron had known what passionate love and longing burned in the bosom of the little girl, whom she idly observed skipping over the rocks, splashing about the beach, or galloping past her gate on a Shetland pony, she would have made her happy by a look or a word. But being tired with her winter's work and busy with her new part, the lady took no more notice of this young neighbor than of the seagulls in the bay or the daisies dancing in the field. No skates left on her doorstop, serenades under her garden wall, and the fixed stares of admiring eyes were such familiar things that she scarcely minded them. And Josie grew desperate when all her little attempts failed. I might climb that pine tree and tumble off on her piazza roof, or get Shelty to throw me just at her gate and be taken in fainting. It's no use to try to drown myself when she is bathing. I can't sink, and she'd only send a man to pull me out. What can I do? I will see her and tell her my hopes and make her say I can act some day. Mamma would believe her, and if, oh, if she would only let me study with her, what perfect joy that would be! Josie made these remarks one afternoon as she and Bess prepared for a swim, a fishing party having prevented their morning bathe. You must bide your time, dear, and not be so impatient. Papa promises to give you a chance before the season is over, and he always manages things nicely. "'That will be better than any queer prank of yours,' answered Bess, tying her pretty hair in a white net to match her suit, while Josie made a little lobster of herself in scarlet. "'I hate to wait, but I suppose I must. I hope she will bathe this afternoon, though it is low tide. She told Uncle she should have to go in then, because in the morning people stared so and went on her beach. Come and have a good dive from the big rock. No one round but nurses and babies, so we can romp and splash as much as we like.' Away they went to have a fine time, for the little bay was free from other bathers, and the babies greatly admired their aquatic gymnastics, both being expert swimmers. As they sat dripping on the big rock, Josie suddenly gave a clutch that nearly sent Bess overboard as she cried excitedly, "'There she is! Look! Coming to bathe! How splendid! Oh, if she only would drown a little and let me save her! Or even get her toe nipped by a crab! Anything so I could go and speak!' don't seem to look she comes to be quiet and enjoy herself pretend we don't see her that's only civil answered bess affecting to be absorbed in a white-winged yacht going by let's carelessly float that way as if going for seaweed on the rocks she can't mind if we are flat on our backs with only our noses out then when we can't help seeing her we'll swim back as if anxious to retire that will impress her and she may call to thank the very polite young ladies who respect her wishes 
proposed Josie, whose lively fancy was always planning dramatic situations. Just as they were going to slip from their rock, as if fate relented at last, Miss Cameron was seen to beckon wildly as she stood waist-deep in the water looking down. She called to her maid, who seemed searching along the beach for something, and not finding what she sought, waved a towel toward the girls as if summoning them to help her. "'Run! Fly! She wants us! She wants us!' cried Josie, tumbling into the water like a very energetic turtle, and swimming away in her best style towards the long-desired haven of joy. Bess followed more slowly, and both came panting and smiling up to Miss Cameron, who never lifted her eyes, but said in that wonderful voice of hers, "'I've dropped a bracelet. I see it, but I can't get it. Will the little boy find me a long stick? I'll keep my eye on it, so the water shall not wash it away.' "'I'll dive for it with pleasure, but I'm not a boy,' answered Josie, laughing as she shook the curly head, which at a distance had deceived the lady. "'I beg your pardon. Dive away, child. The sand is covering it fast. I value it very much. Never forgot to take it off before.' "'I'll get it,' and down went Josie, to come up with a handful of pebbles, but no bracelet. "'It's gone. Never mind. My fault.' said Miss Cameron, disappointed, but amused at the girl's dismay as she shook the water out of her eyes and gasped bravely. "'No, it isn't. I'll have it if I stay down all night.' And with one long breath Josie dived again, leaving nothing but a pair of agitated feet to be seen. "'I'm afraid she'll hurt herself,' said Miss Cameron, looking at Bess, whom she recognized by her likeness to her mother. "'Oh, no, Josie is a little fish. She likes it.' And Bess smiled happily at this wonderful granting of her cousin's desire. "'You are Mr. Lawrence's daughter, I think.' "'How do you do, dear? Tell Papa I'm coming to see him soon. Too tired before. Quite savage. Better now. Ah! Here's our pearl of divers. What's luck?' she asked as the heels went down and a tripping head came up. Josie could only choke and sputter at first, being half strangled, but though her hands had failed again, her courage had not, and with a resolute shake of her wet hair, a bright look at the tall lady, and a series of puffs to fill her lungs, she said calmly, Never give up is my motto. I am going to get it, if I go to Liverpool for it. Now then. And down went the mermaid, quite out of sight this time, groping like a real lobster at the bottom of the sea. Plucky little girl. I like that. Who is she? asked the lady, sitting down on a half-covered stone to watch her diver, since the bracelet was lost sight of. Bess told her, adding with a persuasive smile of her father, "'Josie longs to be an actress, and has waited for a month to see you. This is great happiness for her.' "'Bless the child! Why didn't she come and call? I'd have let her in, though usually I avoid stage-struck girls as I do but reporters,' laughed Miss Cameron. There was no time for more. A brown hand, clasping the bracelet, rose out of the sea, followed by a purple face as Josie came up, so blind and dizzy she could only cling to Bess.' half drowned but triumphant miss cameron drew her to the rock where she sat and pushing the hair out of her eyes revived her with a hearty bravo bravo which assured the girl that her first act was a hit josie had often imagined her meeting with a great actress the dignity and grace with which she would enter and tell her ambitious hopes the effective dress she would wear the witty things she would say the deep impression her budding genius would make but never in her wildest moments had she imagined an interview like this scarlet sandy streaming and speechless she leaned against the illustrious shoulder looking like a beautiful seal as she blinked and wheezed till she could smile joyfully and exclaim proudly i did get it i am so glad now get your breath my dear then i shall be glad also it was very kind of you to take all that trouble for me how shall i thank you asked the lady looking at her with the beautiful eyes that could say so many things without words Josie clasped her hands with a wet spat which rather destroyed the effect of the gesture, and answered in the beseeching tone which would have softened a far harder heart than Miss Cameron's. "'Let me come and see you once, only once. I want you to tell me if I can act. You will know. I'll abide by what you say, and if you think I can, by and by, when I've studied very hard, I shall be the happiest girl in the world. May I?' "'Yes. Come to-morrow at eleven. We'll have a good talk. You shall show me what you can do, and I'll give you my opinion. But you won't like it. I will, no matter if you tell me I'm a fool. I want it settled. So does Mamma. I'll take it bravely if you say no, and if you say yes, I'll never give up till I've done my best, as you did. Ah, my child, it's a weary road, and there are plenty of thorns among the roses when you've won them. I think you have the courage, and this proves that you have the perseverance. Perhaps you do. Come, and we'll see. 
Miss Cameron touched the bracelet as she spoke, and smiled so kindly that impetuous Josie wanted to kiss her, but wisely refrained, though her eyes were wet with softer water than any in the sea, as she thanked her. "'We are keeping Miss Cameron from her bath, and the tide is going out. Come, Josie,' said thoughtful Bess, fearing to outstay their welcome. "'Run over the beach and get warm. Thank you very much, little mermaid. Tell Papa to bring his daughter to see me any time. Good-bye.' and with a wave of her hand the tragedy queen dismissed her court, but remained on her weedy throne watching the two lithe figures race over the sand with twinkling feet till they were out of sight. Then, as she calmly bobbed up and down in the water, she said to herself, "'The child has a good stage face, vivid, mobile, fine eyes, abandoned, pluck, will. Perhaps she'll do. Good stock, talent in the family. We shall see.' Of course, Josie never slept a wink, and was in a fever of joyful excitement next day. Uncle Laurie enjoyed the episode very much, and Aunt Amy looked out her most becoming white dress for the grand occasion. Bess lent her most artistic hat, and Josie ranged the wood and marsh for a bouquet of wild roses, sweet white azalea, ferns, and graceful grasses, as the offering of a very grateful heart. At ten she solemnly arrayed herself, and then sat looking at her neat gloves and buckled shoes till it was time to go growing pale and sober with the thought that her fate would soon be decided, for like all young people she was sure that her whole life could be settled by one human creature, quite forgetting how wonderfully providence trains us by disappointment, surprises us with unexpected success, and turns our seeming trials into blessings. "'I will go alone. We shall be free or so. Oh, Bess, pray that she may tell me rightly. So much depends on that. Don't laugh, Uncle. It is a very serious moment for me. Miss Cameron knows that, and will tell you so. Kiss me, Aunt Amy, since Mamma is in here. If you say I look nice, I'm quite satisfied. Good-bye. And with a wave of the hand, as much like her models as she could make it, Josie departed, looking very pretty and feeling very tragical. Sure now of admittance, she boldly rang at the door which excluded so many, and being ushered into the shady parlour, feasted her eyes upon several fine portraits of great actors while she waited. She had read about most of them, and knew their trials and triumphs so well that she nearly forgot herself, and tried to imitate Mrs. Sidons as Lady Macbeth, looking up at the engraving as she held her nosegay like the candle in the sleep-walking scene, and knit her youthful brows distressfully while murmuring the speech of the haunted queen. So busy was she that Miss Cameron watched her for several minutes unseen, then startled her by suddenly sweeping in with the words upon her lips, the look upon her face which made that one of her greatest scenes. "'I never can do it like that, but I'll keep trying if you say I may,' cried Josie, forgetting her manners in the intense interest of the moment. "'Show me what you can do,' answered the actress, wisely plunging into the middle of things at once, well knowing that no common chat would satisfy this very earnest little person. First, let me give you these. I thought you'd like wild things better than hothouse flowers, and I love to bring them, as I'd no other way to thank you for your great kindness to me.' said Josie, offering her nosegay with a simple warmth that was very sweet. "'I do love them best, and keep my room full of the posies some good fairy hangs on my gate. Upon my word, I think I found the fairy out. These are so like,' she added quickly, as her eyes went from the flowers in her hand to others that stood nearby, arranged with the same taste. Josie's blush and smile betrayed her before she said, with a look full of girlish adoration and humility, I couldn't help it. I admire you so much. I know it was a liberty, but as I couldn't get in myself, I love to think my posies pleased you. Something about the child and her little offering touched the woman, and drawing Josie to her, she said, with no trace of actress in face or voice, They did please me, dear, and so do you. I'm tired of praise, and love is very sweet, when it is simple and sincere like this. Josie remembered to have heard, among many other stories, that Miss Cameron lost her lover years ago, and since had lived only for art. Now she felt that this might have been true, and pity for the splendid lonely life made her face very eloquent as well as grateful. Then, as if anxious to forget the past, her new friend said, in the commanding way that seemed natural to her, "'Let me see what you can do. Juliet, of course. All begin with that. Poor soul, how she is murdered!' Now, Josie had intended to begin with Romeo's much-enduring sweetheart, and follow her up with Bianca, Pauline, and several of the favorite idols of stage-struck girls, but being a shrewd little person, she suddenly saw the wisdom of Uncle Larry's device, and resolved to follow it. 
so instead of the rant Miss Cameron expected, Josie gave poor Ophelia's mad scene, and gave it very well, having been trained by the college professor of elocution and done it many times. She was too young, of course, but the white gown, the loose hair, the real flowers she scattered over the imaginary grave added to the illusion, and she sung the song sweetly, dropped her pathetic curtsies, and vanished behind the curtain that divided the rooms, with a backward look that surprised her critical auditor into a quick gesture of applause. Cheered by that welcome sound, Josie ran back as a little hoyden in one of the farces she had often acted, telling a story full of fun and naughtiness at first, but ending with a sob of repentance and an earnest prayer for pardon. "'Very good. Try again. Better than I expected,' called the voice of the oracle. Josie tried Portia's speech and recited very well, giving due emphasis to every fine sentence. Then, unable to refrain from what she considered her greatest effort, she burst into Juliet's balcony scene, ending with the poison in the tomb. She felt sure that she surpassed herself and waited for applause. The ringing laugh made her tingle with indignation and disappointment as she went to stand before Miss Cameron, saying in a tone of polite surprise, "'I have been told that I did it very well. I'm sorry you don't think so.' "'My dear, it's very bad. How can it help being so?' What can a child like you know of love and fear and death? Don't try it yet. Leave tragedy alone till you are ready for it. But you clapped Ophelia. Yes, that was very pretty. Any clever girl can do it effectively. But the real meaning of Shakespeare is far above you yet, child. The comedy bit was best. There you showed real talent. It was both comic and pathetic. That's art. Don't lose it. The Portia was good declamation. Go on with that sort of thing. It trains the voice, teaches shades of expression. You've a good voice and natural grace. Great helps both, hard to acquire. Well, I'm glad I've got something, sighed Josie, sitting meekly on a stool, much crestfallen, but not daunted yet, and bound to have her say out. My dear little girl, I told you you would not like what I would say to you. Yet I must be honest if I would really help you. I've had to do it for many like you, and most of them have never forgiven me, though my words have proved true, and they are what I advise them to be, good wives and happy mothers in quiet homes. A few have kept on and done fairly well. One you will hear of soon, I think, for she has talent, indomitable patience, and mind as well as beauty. You are too young to show to which class you belong. Geniuses are very rare, and even at fifteen seldom give much promise of future power." "'Oh, I don't think I'm a genius,' cried Josie, growing calm and sober as she listened to the melodious voice and looking into the expressive face that filled her with confidence. So strong, sincere, and kindly was it. "'I only want to find out if I have talent enough to go on, and after years of study to be able to act well in any of the good plays people never tire of seeing. I don't expect to be a Mrs. Sidens or a Miss Cameron, much as I long to be, but it does seem as if I had something in me which can't come out in any way but this. When I act, I'm perfectly happy. I seem to live, to be in my own world, and each new part is a new friend. I love Shakespeare, and am never tired of his splendid people. Of course, I don't understand it all, but it's like being alone at night with the mountains and stars, solemn and grand, and I try to imagine how it will look when the sun comes out, and all is glorious and clear to me. I can't see, but I feel the beauty, and long to express it. As she spoke, with the most perfect self-forgetfulness, Josie was pale with excitement. Her eyes shone, her lips trembled, and all her little soul seemed trying to put into words the emotions that filled it to overflowing. Miss Cameron understood, felt that this was something more than a girlish whim, and when she answered there was a new tone of sympathy in her voice, a new interest in her face though she wisely refrained from saying all she thought, well knowing what splendid dreams young people build upon a word, and how bitter is the pain when the bright bubbles burst. If you feel this, I can give you no better advice than to go on loving and studying our great master, she said slowly. But Josie caught the changed tone, and felt with a thrill of joy that her new friend was speaking to her now as a comrade. It is an education in itself, and a lifetime is not long enough to teach you all his secret but there is much to do before you can hope to echo his words. Have you the patience, courage, strength, to begin at the beginning, and slowly, painfully lay the foundation for future work? Fame is a pearl many die for, and only a few bring up. Even when they do, it is not perfect, and they sigh for more, and lose better things in struggling for them. The last word seemed spoken more to herself than to her hearer, 
but Josie answered quickly, with a smile and an expressive gesture. I got the bracelet in spite of all the bitter water in my eyes. You did. I don't forget it. A good omen. We will accept it. Miss Cameron answered the smile with one that was like sunshine to the girl, and stretched her white hands as if taking some invisible gift. Then added in a different tone, watching the effect of her words on the expressive face before her. Now you will be disappointed, for instead of telling you to come and study with me, or go and act in some second-rate theatre at once, I advise you to go back to school and finish your education. That is the first step, for all accomplishments are needed, and a single talent makes a very imperfect character. Cultivate mind and body, heart and soul, and make yourself an intelligent, graceful, beautiful, and healthy girl. Then, at eighteen or twenty, go into training and try your powers. Better start for the battle with your arms in order, and save the hard lesson which comes when we rush on too soon. Now and then genius carries all before it, but not often. We have to climb slowly, with many slips and falls. Can you wait as well as work? I will. We shall see. It would be pleasant to me to know that when I quit the stage I leave behind me a well-trained, beautiful, gifted comrade to more than fill my place and carry on what I have much at heart, the purification of the stage. Perhaps you are she, but remember, mere beauty and rich costumes do not make an actress, nor are the efforts of a clever little girl to play great characters real art. It is all dazzle and sham and a disgrace and disappointment now. Why will the public be satisfied with off or boof or the trash called society plays when a world of truth and beauty, poetry and pathos lies waiting to be interpreted and enjoyed? Miss Cameron had forgotten to whom she spoke, and walked to and fro, full of the noble regret all cultivated people feel at the low state of the stage nowadays. That's what Uncle Larry says, and he and Aunt Jo try to plan plays about true and lovely things, simple domestic scenes that touch people's hearts and make them laugh and cry and feel better. Uncle says that sort is my style, and I must not think of tragedy. But it's so much nicer to sweep about in crowns and velvet trains than to wear everyday clothes and just be myself though it's so easy. Yet that is a high art, child, and what we need for a time till we are ready for the masters. Cultivate that talent of yours. It is a special gift, this power to bring tears and smiles, and a sweeter task to touch the heart than to freeze the blood or fire the imagination. Tell your uncle he is right, and ask your aunt to try a play for you. I'll come and see it when you are ready. Will you? Oh, will you? We are going to have some at Christmas with a nice part for me. A simple little thing, but I can do it. I should be so proud, so happy to have you there. Josie rose as she spoke, for a glance at the clock showed that her call was a long one, and hard as it was to end this momentous interview, she felt that she must go. Catching up her hat, she went to Miss Cameron, who stood looking at her so keenly that she felt as transparent as a pane of glass, and colored prettily as she looked up, saying, with a grateful little tremor in her voice, I can never thank you for this hour and all you have told me. I will do just what you advise, and Mamma will be very glad to see me settled at my books again. I can study now with all my heart, because it is to help me on, and I won't hope too much, but work and wait and try to please you is the only way to pay my debt. That reminds me that I have not paid mine. Little friend, wear this for my sake. It is fit for a mermaid and will remind you of your first dive. May the next bring up a better jewel and leave no bitter water on your lips. As she spoke, Miss Cameron took from the lace at her throat a pretty pin of aquamarine and fastened it like an order on Josie's proud bosom. Then, lifting the happy little face, she kissed it very tenderly and watched it go smiling away with eyes that seemed to see into a future full of the trials and triumphs which she knew so well. Bess expected to see Josie come flying in, all raptures and excitement, or drowned in tears of disappointment, but was surprised at the expression of calm content and resolution which she wore. Pride and satisfaction, and a new feeling of responsibility both sobered and sustained her, and she felt that any amount of dry studying and long waiting would be bearable, if, in the glorious future, she could be an honor to her profession and a comrade to the new friend whom she already adored with girlish ardor. She told her little story to a deeply interested audience, and all felt that Miss Cameron's advice was good. Mrs. Amy was relieved at the prospect of delay, for she did not want her niece to be an actress, and hoped the fancy would die out. Uncle Larry was full of charming plans and prophecies, and wrote one of his most delightful notes to thank their neighbor for her kindness, while Bess, who loved art of all kinds, fully sympathized with her cousin's ambitious hopes, only wondering why she preferred to act out her visions rather than embody them in marble. 
That first interview was not the last, for Miss Cameron was really interested, and had several memorable conversations with the Lawrences, while the girls sat by, drinking in every word with the delight all artists feel in their own beautiful world, and learning to see how sacred good gifts are, how powerful and how faithfully they should be used for high ends, each in its own place helping to educate, refine, and refresh. Josie wrote reams to her mother, and when the visit ended, rejoiced her heart by bringing her a somewhat changed little daughter, who fell to work at the once detested books with a patient energy which surprised and pleased every one. The right string had been touched, and even French exercises and piano practice became endurable, since accomplishments would be useful by and by. Dress, manners, and habits were all interesting now, because mind and body, heart and soul must be cultivated, and while training to become an intelligent, graceful, healthy girl, little Josie was unconsciously fitting herself to play her part well on whatever stage the great manager might prepare for her. End of chapter 8